Hi, my name is David Morrison. I'm a NASA space scientist, and I want to talk to you very briefly about Nibiru. I'm doing this because I received a note from a 12-year-old girl recently that said she wondered if the video I made two years ago was still valid, that she and her classmates were scared about Nibiru, and could I please explain, from a science point of view, why we know Nibiru is not real and is not a danger. You know, the, the simplest thing to say is just that there is no credible evidence whatever for the existence of Nibiru. Uh, there are no pictures, there's no tracking, there's no astronomical observations. In fact, the origin of the name is a little weird. Nibiru was a minor god in the Babylonian pantheon, probably associated with Jupiter. There's no record that they ever thought of it as a planet. Sometimes we talk about planet X, but that's a strange term too, because astronomers say planet X for an object that has not been found, a, a possible object like Pluto. When it was being searched for, it was called planet X. Once it was found, it became Pluto. So it really isn't any evidence here to counter, but I can quite specifically say how we know that Nibiru or planet X does not exist and does not threaten the Earth. First, if there were a planet headed into the inner solar system that was going to come close to the Earth in December of 2012, it would already be inside the orbit of Mars. It would be bright. It would be easily visible to the naked eye. If it were up there, you could see it. All of us could see it. And the crazy thing is people who say they are observing it but never tell us where to look so we can verify. Well, it doesn't take an astronomer to say that there's no bright object up there that's appeared in the night sky and is headed for Earth. Second, if Nibiru were real and it were a planet with a substantial mass, then it would already be perturbing the orbits of Mars and the Earth. We would see changes in those orbits due to this rogue object coming into the inner solar system. Astronomers measure the orbit of Earth and Mars precisely and frequently, and there has been no change whatever. Third, and perhaps most telling, if this object had come through the solar system in the past, and, and you remember the, the idea is it's on an orbit of 3,600 years, if it had come through in the past, its gravity would have messed up the orbits of the inner planets, the Earth, Venus, Mars, probably would have stripped the moon away completely. Instead, in the inner solar system, we see planets with stable orbits. We see the moon going around the Earth. The very existence of this stability in the inner solar system proves that no rogue planet, no interfering object has come through the inner solar system in at least a million years. So it's not real. Nibiru doesn't exist. We can't see it. We can't detect its gravity and we don't see a signature of its previous passages because there weren't any. Now, some people change the story around and say, well, Nibiru isn't even a planet. It's a brown dwarf with planets going around it or, or something like that. Everything I've said would be worse with a massive object like a brown dwarf. That would have been tracked by astronomers for a decade or more, and it would already have really affected planetary orbits. So please. Get over it. Nibiru isn't real. Planet X isn't real. We don't have to worry about this hoax. I'm Jim Green, Director of Planetary Science at NASA. You know, NASA works with the international science community to explore our solar system and beyond. We look to unravel the mysteries that intrigue us all as we explore and answer the big questions. Questions like, how did the Earth originate and change over time? How did the solar system begin and evolve? And what will be its destiny? What will be our destiny? Last July 14th, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto, capping a half century of exploration of our solar system. 
it piqued our interest about what lies beyond Pluto and what can we learn about ourselves and the origins of our solar system. The idea of a new planet is certainly an exciting one for me as a planetary scientist, and I think for all of us. The January 20th paper in the Astronomical Journal is fueling our interest in planetary exploration and stimulating a healthy debate that's part of the scientific process. I couldn't be more pleased about what's happening. You know, it's all about starting the process that could lead to an exciting result. It is not, however, the detection of a new planet. It's too early to say with certainty that there is a so-called Planet X out there. What we're really seeing is an early prediction based on modeling from limited observations. What's exciting is that, like NASA's journey to Mars or New Horizons flyby of Pluto, you will have a front row seat to see how the scientific process unfolds. Theories like this serve to stimulate ideas and conversation. They tap into our innate curiosity. It's important for us to continue to work, and we will. Anytime we have an interesting idea like this, we always apply Carl Sagan's rules for critical thinking, which include independent confirmation of the facts, looking for alternate explanations, and encouraging scientific debate. If Planet X is out there, we'll find it together. Or we'll determine an alternate explanation for the data that we've received so far. Now. Let's go explore. The sun is tilted by six degrees with respect to the plane of the planets. The reason for the non-zero solar obliquity has been a mystery since it was first discovered by Sir Richard Carrington in the mid-1800s. It turns out that Planet Nine um, can actually tilt the sun. The, the fact that the sun is tilted, even if it's only by six degrees, the fact that the sun is tilted, you know, the sun is the most massive thing in our solar system by a huge margin, and it's oriented differently than everything else in the solar system. That is an incredibly strange phenomenon for which there really has have not been that many explanations even attempted over the last 150 years. It's naturally explained by Planet Nine being exactly where we think Planet Nine is, which uh, it, it's one of these mysteries that's now that we think is now solved that's been such a mystery that people haven't even really talked about it very much over the last 150 years because it's just been so difficult to think of what it is. It has been known since the mid-1800s that the sun is tilted over the years. People have put forth various explanations for it. One possibility is that the sun uh, was interacting with the protoplanetary disk um, via magnetic fields. Um, it's also possible that the disk was just asymmetrical from the beginning. And it's also possible that the sun actually had a stellar companion a long time ago. It was a, a moment of inspiration. Not all projects start out this way. Not all results really come. Some of them come, you know, it slowly dawns on you. We were sitting in Constantine's office one afternoon and we were, we were actually thinking about a different problem entirely, which is how Planet Nine would interact with these very distant objects in the Kuiper Belt that made us originally think that Planet Nine was there. And in just a moment, as we're, we're thinking about it, and we're doing this with our hands, trying to think of directions things are going, I think we both realize at about the same time, it's like, oh, it's going to make the sun look tilted too. And it was very clear from the way we did our fingers that it was going to make an effect. What we didn't know until we did the calculations was how much of an effect was it going to have and in what direction was it going to go. But we knew it had to do something. Planet Nine has been scattered out into the distant solar system. So because it has a low orbital period that's so long, it has an enormous amount of angular momentum, right? as much almost as the rest of the solar system combined. So even though as an object it is not as massive as Jupiter, it has a huge lever bar. Right? And using that lever bar, it can effectively torque the rest of the disk of the solar system by six degrees over the age of the sun. Next, uh, always next on our list, 
is find the planet. Um, we think we have it narrowed down to a pretty small patch in the sky that we have to look at. Small patch in the sky still means we need many, many nights on the telescope. Uh, we, we're pretty convinced that by uh, maybe next, the end of next winter, we will have been able to cover enough sky that we'll actually be able to find it. When we find it, we both show that this hypothesis has been correct, we learn about it, but we also see how much of the sun, how, how it should have tilted the sun too, and see if this is the only thing that's been tilting the sun or if other things are around doing it.